The person I'm going to introduce in a second is not a career educator, and uh, he does drop his son off every day at school, and he spends time with us doing things like this. Um, but his work in, in a lot of ways exists really globally around the world, and I think relatively soon is going to be interplanetarily. Uh, there'll be an interplanetary uh, context for the work. Um, personally, I'll, I'll just uh, share this story. For me, um, when we knew that we were going to be launching the, the PBL Leadership Academy and we knew we were going to be bringing in guest speakers and guest faculty, it was really important to me that we reached out to people who were doing things around the world, um, whether they were in education or not, that, that we just thought were cool. Um, so that's actually where I started. And I'm a person who loves um, love the outdoors. I love exploration. I love, um, I love, um, I mean, this is going to sound insane, but I love Indiana Jones. All right, that's what I wanted to be when I was growing up. That's who I wanted to be when I was growing up. Um, and I started looking for people who were doing work like that. Um, and relatively quickly, I found um, Albert Eumann Lin's work online, searching for the tomb of Genghis Khan. Um, I gave him a phone call and described the project, and I was really surprised that he returned my email right away. I answered the phone. This was awesome. I was like, this is incredible. Um, and that I, didn't, I actually didn't even know that you were at UCSD, which I, I, I found you through Nat Geo. And I, I assumed I was going to be calling someone who was very far away, and I was like, he's right down the road. Um, so we've been doing some of this work now together for, this is now the second year, and um, I've seen... Albert's work changed in a lot of ways over in two years. That's really inspiring to what we're doing at High Tech High. Uh, um, what initially got me excited was someone who's searching for a tomb. You know? And then what I realized was that actually this is someone who's um, exploding the concept of what a real project actually is and where these ideas actually come from. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Albert Yumin Lin. Thanks, Randy. So, sorry, my voice is a little hoarse. I just got back from South by Southwest. Uh, it was pretty wild. Actually, I was on stage, and, uh, and right before I got on stage, somebody was like, break a leg, Albert. <laughs> I was like, you. <laughs> 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 but we'll get to that part later. So, uh, this is a picture that I took just maybe two weeks ago. My son, Charlie, who's now in first grade in school right over there uh, in one of those classrooms, was sitting down before breakfast. He had this book, you know, this Dr. Seuss book, uh, What Do You Want to Be? And I looked over, and this is what he had written down. And to me, it was, oh, I was, I was like, ah, oh, I feel so good as a dad to see that. But also, at the same time, after a while, I started looking at the other lists of jobs here, and it's, you know, it's, it's explorers not on there. I mean, I can think of a lot of ways to give my kid advice, but I can't really think of what degree he should get in college if he wants to be an explorer. You know, you can, you can pretty much give a, a, some advice to each one of these jobs, but explorer, what does that mean? How do you, how do you advise somebody on what degree to get I don't know. I mean, I remember when I was uh, picking schools, I basically just threw a dart at the little college apps to figure out what degree I was going to get. <laughs> I could have been in business, which would have been pretty lame for me, at least. But I ended up being an engineer. And as an engineer, it was like, OK, I'm going to stick to engineering. And then all of a sudden, it was like, I'm going to try something else. And when I finished my PhD in engineering, it was all of a sudden this question, like, well, what's really in my heart? And that's when it got really serious. For my kids, I think being an explorer is all about the sort of experience. This is what we do on the weekends. See here. Oh. This is my kids exploring. This is my daughter, Milana. My son, Charlie. And they've got a pickaxe, and we're looking for fossils. Uh, maybe we can turn, is there a way to turn the lights down? Because they're so cute. You've got to see them. You know, I think of my, my kids as, <clears throat> as astronauts. Uh, this is a picture I took in Death Valley, and then I photoshopped, obviously, to get my kid on the moon. Uh, but I think it's pretty apropos to what's going on now. You know, you think about my grandparents' generation and my parents' generation. They're, 
their careers were defined by these inspirational quests at a societal level. You know, my, my parents were both sort of wandering folks, and my dad became a, an astrophysicist. And I think it was because, you know, that era of saying, let's go to land on the moon. And it inspired so many people across a generation to want to go and be engineers or astronauts or, or really anything. <clears throat> For my son and my daughter, I think their moonshot is the Earth. It's a different planet, right? It's a different celestial body. It's, it's looking back at the Earth and saying what it's going to happen now, what their generation is going to do in the next 50 years, you know, that's really going to def define the course of the next 10,000 years because of all the tipping points you face, all the challenges you face. It's this grand opportunity, right? So it is a moonshot moment. Now, this is a, you know, sort of a, an analogy that I think everybody here is familiar with, but most of the schools that we started taking my kids to in the beginning were very much traditional. You know, it was based on an education system that was designed for a different era, designed for that whole sort of production and consumption era. And my kid really started, Charlie, he was the first one, he started telling me, I remember, you know, in kindergarten coming home one day and my son saying that he hated going to school. In kindergarten. It's like, man, you got a long way to go there, buddy. Uh, so that's when we said we needed to find a different, a different solution. More important than what you know and what you memorize, I think, is how you feel about learning, how you feel about your own ambitions and your own curiosity and whether or not it's worth it. And that's really what, you know, what it means to be an explorer. For me, I think one of the most sort of important parts in my young childhood was when my parents bought me uh, a little telescope, not a little microscope, and I would spend all my time just staring at things, you know, little whatever I could find in the backyard. And I ended up with a PhD in material science years later, right? It, was, it wasn't a class, it was, it was a little microscope that my parents bought me that all of a sudden made me really think that you could just find new stuff. It was like looking into these new worlds, right? Years later, you know, you fast forward to last year, last summer we were in the jungles of Guatemala using drones and and, and satellites and, and all sorts of other things to try to map through the canopy to look at this little specimen that is our earth, to look for these tombs in the ancient Maya landscape at the Paten. And it was like, oh man, you know, it's just about being curious. I just wanted to quickly go through a couple of projects. You know, the first project that I had was, was really about Genghis Khan, as we mentioned. And for me, that, that stemmed out of um, a desire to know my own homeland. This is Mongolia. Got the world's fastest sheep, I always say. <laughs> Super powered. The, uh, the landscape is massive. And I was reading all these books about my own ancestry, and I, and I found this book about Genghis Khan, and I realized that there was this sort of magical story, but it was still alive today. There was supposedly an area on the border of now Russia and Mongolia that was about 6,000 square kilometers in size that was deemed forbidden to go to by Genghis Khan himself 800 years ago, and today still remains this highly restricted zone guarded by the same tribe of people. It's like, man, that stuff still exists, that Indiana Jones kind of stuff. 800 years ago, Genghis Khan said anybody who entered that land was punishable by death. Today, the only people who are allowed there are shamans and, and politicians and the local, you know, sort of uh, guards of this land that live there, armed, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. And I thought, man, I got to go there. Uh, but first of all, if I wanted to find anything in there, because the legend says that his tomb would be in the center of this forbidden precinct. Because nobody's ever known what Genghis Khan or, uh, you know, any of his ancestors, any of them really were like. All we know is their legacy. There was never a painting of them during their own time. There was never anything written about them in the contemporary time of their, their, their lives by their own people. It's like, man, the story of my own people is just unknown. And yet, there is this person who created the largest empire in human history, like the ultimate project-based badass, right? Uh, but... I wanted to know more. So I just started using that thing that's inside me, that, that like, okay, my, I, I'm curious, I'm gonna be a problem solver, I'm gonna try different things out, I'm an engineer. So I started writing all these 
satellite imaging companies, asking them for data. And they gave me all this huge amount of data where, you know, like the size of this chair basically is one pixel from space. And then it's like, okay, well, what do you do then? Uh, we got to find some way of sifting through all this data. So I started turning to my friends that were doing computer science PhDs or machine learning PhDs or things like this. I'm like, well, you got to know what you're looking for. So I don't know what I'm looking for. So then I turned to this gaming friend of mine who was doing game design work. He's like, well, maybe we can get, he told me about this research project where they were looking for Steve Fawcett's body after he went missing and they were using uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk to sift through all the satellite imagery data. And I'm like, okay, well, let's try the same thing. So we built this website where we, uh, where we got millions of people online. Well, at first we didn't know if anybody would get on there, but then over time, we built this website where we allowed people to tag the imagery and tell us what they saw. And then we would use hundreds of people to look at the same exact location on a map. And then we'd add up all their data and this is, a, this is a subsection of our imagery and the data from the people that were tagging all that imagery, each little subsection. And at first it looks like noise, but then you start to see these trends emerge. This is over two million data points. And the trends look like this. They're like little roads and little dots and weird things here and there. And I could actually start measuring where people were agreeing. And this was really one of the most powerful moments for me when I realized that in our digital age we can solve huge problems together if we work together in these new constructs of the internet. They sifted through 6,000 square kilometers of satellite imagery and we ended up identifying where people were agreeing the most and we rode out on horseback and started looking at those sites. I'll play you a little video of one of those, of our first, I think of our first big expedition that I got some funding for. So uh, if you told me that's what science was going to be like, I'd say sign me up. I think any kid probably would. Uh, and yet we think that it's not like that, but it is. You know, we rode around on horseback and we checked out all these different sites uh, and where the crowd would send us, where we could find those points of agreement, we started finding things. In fact, I found over 40-something tombs, 44 to be exact, one of which uh, we think might actually potentially be it. We'd go and we'd find these sites and we'd use tools that were developed by the construction and you know, industrial sort of in industries to, to map in the subsurface. Because one of the things about the Mongolian culture is that if you, they say if you disturb the tomb of Genghis Khan, then you're going to sort of upset the living spirit of Genghis Khan and you'd cause a curse. That ends the world. Uh, it's like, oh, I don't want to do that. But you can look with new eyes if you're a problem solver. So we started using magnetometry, electromagnetic induction, ground penetrating radar. Oh, are you okay? Yeah. This, is a, this is a survey. It's got the world's fastest graduate students and, uh, and the survey. And when they'd survey these things, we started looking around and you'd start finding things in the subsurface that you knew were you know, bits of metal or maybe you know some anomaly, and we're starting to look and see. Okay, is this like what are the characteristics of this stuff that's under the ground without having to dig? My team was just engineers, and every night we would, you know, build our yurts. These are the yurts that have been lived in for thousands of years by the Mongols, uh, and we would sleep in those yurts, charge our gear, download our data from the satellite modem, and then these storms would roll in. Every, every night, these huge winds and 
massive electrical storms. But we just keep pushing on. So eventually, we wanted to go into this mountain, mountainous region. And in the center of the mountainous region was this one anomaly that everybody had sent us to. It was the only thing that they saw in the forested region at all. And what it ended up being was this massive shaman shrine at the center of the Forbidden Precinct on a very specific mountain. And there was a couple of shrines like this based on different points of the, of the mountain. And you can see the storm whipping around us. You can see you know, uh, the wind. You can, you can actually, f I don't know, if, if you were there, you, you couldn't wear enough clothes to get through this kind of wind. You know, you, it was just flying through everything. It was knocking everything down. And it ended up knocking all these trees down. And as we, descend, we, we sort of went, started cruising down, descending down the southeast flank of this mountain, we started noticing that all these trees, these new trees had fallen down. And in the middle shrine, at the base of those trees, we would make these discoveries. These discoveries that ultimately would change my life. You know, I'm looking in these trees, and the next thing you know, we start seeing artifacts of a temple some kind of roof, you know, we start looking around, we're like, oh my gosh, what is this? Go look at that tree, go look at that tree, see what you find. And we're cruising around, and it's like, everywhere you go, it's like a <laughs> crunching under your feet, and then you just look up, you know, you just sort of pull up the grass, and the next thing you see is that you're standing on basically a roof, buried under the ground. And in and amongst the roof, I found horse bones and, you know, gold leaf, little bits of lacquer and, and arrowheads and all this stuff now radiocarbon dated confirms that it's right from the time of Genghis Khan's death. It's at the center of a forbidden precinct that only the imperial family could go and visit. Uh, and it's on the exact mountain where the shamans still today worship the spirit of Genghis Khan. So like, oh, this is pretty compelling. Over time, we used magnetometry and electroresistivity tomography to try to map what's under the subsurface and put that back into 3D virtual reality and to see if we could rebuild the tomb without destroying it. So for me, this was like, oh, this is an unbelievable experience. You know, the Mongolian government actually embargoed our findings and put uh, you know, put it all on lockdown until they could figure out what to do with it all. I think they just are... They just submitted a bid to the UNESCO World Heritage Committee to try to see if they could create a World Heritage Site out of it. But if you could tell me, like, how you would design a curriculum to get a, that experience to be in somebody's career afterwards, I don't, I don't know, right? It's not really, uh, it's not really about, I guess, well, I guess there was a lot of science in there. There was a lot of, you know, engineering and, uh, and everything else, but more than anything, it was just like just believing that you could do pretty much anything. Like just having enough people around you that said, yeah, be crazy, go find that tomb, you know? Out of that, other things happened. It wasn't about finding the tomb. Like launching, you know, man's journey onto the moon, all this other stuff came out of that, right? Like we built this crowdsourcing website. Uh, which, you know, the Washington Post said, projects like this one mark a new twist in citizen science where new technology, when used effectively by large groups of people, can help speed up scientific developments, reduce costs, and increase efficiency. The government got all freaked out and started asking me for all these briefings. I sat, you know, at the Pentagon with the head of the Department of Defense, uh, you know, for the research division. I, I was asked to debrief the head of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And this is like spooky stuff, right? Uh, and what we realized was that maybe, you know, we were onto something here. So my team and I, we launched a company called Tomnod, which in Mongolian means the big eye in the sky. And, or just the big eye. And we started using it to try to do things that we thought were important, right? Like mapping the plight of folks who have been struck by a disaster, for example. Or, uh, you know, in the case of the Malaysia airline plane, we had literally 8 million people online in a single weekend go through a million square kilometers of data. 
And, you know, while they didn't find the plane, they found a ton of trash. But it was more important than that, to me, this experiment where 8 million people get online for a weekend and they do something together. I mean, they turn the human mind into this massively collaborative parallel computing engine to try to do something that they felt was important. I mean, think about the possibilities there. You know, the, the challenge here is that there was so much kind of, uh, like, media attention involved in getting people to be online, you know, emotionally compelled by this thing. But, you know, I think probably one of the largest untapped scientific contributors on our planet is the population of kids that are in your classroom. I mean, think if they were actually connected in a way where they can take on huge challenges and solve those massive scale data challenges. Or even if you just sent them outside and had them starting to do scientific observations in some coordinated way, you could never make an army of millions of scientific observers that would be even close to that kind of power. Okay, fast forward a little bit. My next big project. Okay, how do you train for this one? What degree do you get for this one? Four months ago, I got in a car accident. Four months ago. And uh, it was kind of brutal. It was a little rollover accident. I was four-wheel driving. I had to relearn how to be a human being again, trying to walk. You can see my like, eyes there, I'm just freaked out. Actually, the nurse is more compelling. She's like, what the hell's going on here? And this guy's freaking out. But again, it was about that like, support network. How do you train to get over something like this? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's more about just having people around you that are staying super positive. It was right around Halloween, so it was almost five months ago, actually. Actually, I think it's five months now. Uh, and I think the first thing that happened to me was my, my kids were they're like, Daddy, you can be a pirate now. <laughs> so that's, that's what we did. Let me go back to that one. Uh-oh. Yeah. I'm a pirate. That's my son, Charlie. My daughter, Milana. And I'm the pirate. Yes. But then we started thinking about, okay, Pirate aside, I got to rebuild the human experience. So I started looking at, you know, the best in prosthetic technology. Uh, I worked with this guy, Peter Harsh, who used to be the head of the Naval Medical Clinics for prosthetics. Now he's got a private clinic. I started looking at building these legs, and now I have this awesome leg. But it's like, okay, well, what can I use from my own experiences? Last summer in Guatemala, we were in these caves uh, that we had dug out of these Maya temples. You can see this Maya temple in the middle of the jungle here. And I send our graduate students and ourselves into this. I mean, like, it's kind of crazy in there. There's snakes. There's this Fairlance snake that'll, like, it'll, it'll kill you pretty much 50% of the time, even with anti-venom. And there's so many of them down here. We go down into these things, uh, and we start using... Simple technologies to try to create these 3D maps of what we're finding down here inside these Maya temples. Things like the sensor to an Xbox Connect, randomly, right? Or, you know, uh, your iPhone. You can create these 3D models with photogrammetry right now. And I was thinking about it. It's like, okay, I have this badass prosthetic clinic I can go to, but the majority of the world doesn't. There's, I think, 40 million amputees out there, the majority of which live in the developing world, many of which were the result of our actions as a country, because we left a bunch of mines out there. I said, well, what can I do with the stuff I've been learning here and apply that to the kind of care I'm getting, you know, with Peter? And we started building an approach to using the same archaeological technology to try to create artificial legs. Because the difference between having, you know, no artificial leg and having one is that I lost my leg five months ago, and two weekends ago I skied at 50 miles per hour. 
cruising down the mountain, stoked out of my mind. Last week I surfed three times. I'm doing all those things I want to do, and this summer I'm going to be back, you know, I'm going to be back in Guatemala with all this new data looking for all these new tombs that we just found and the satellite imagery and the, and the, the laser scans. And out of all this came this experience where I think, okay, I can apply technology and I can understand technology now to try to understand the human experience in a new way. So Nat Geo reached out to me and said, well, let's try to do something about this. And here's a little trailer of what we're working on now. Technology is improving the human species. Artificial intelligence, bionics, nanotech, they're changing our very biology. We're on the brink of all these wondrous things. Since the dawn of mankind, technology has shaped our world. Now, it's shaping us. I'm Dr. Albert Lin, technologist, and National Geographic Explorer. A catastrophic accident recently changed my life. Technology is now a part of me. But in the future, it will be part of us all. Being human will never be the same again. thing is happening that transcends humanity. The true integration of the man and the machine. Changing technology, changing genes, and a changing mindset have conspired to make us stronger, faster, bolder, and better than ever. Together, we can go places, achieve incredible dreams. And one day, we will share our future. The line between man and machine will be crossed. We the people need not accept our limitations, but can transcend our limitations through technological innovation. Up and I'm like, oh, I want to watch that video again. <laughs> I can't wait. So I wanted to end with something that I'm trying to do that's closer to home. Uh, and it's been awesome to work with Randy and others and dreaming this stuff up. But I think the experience of being an explorer is something that I, may be the most important, I don't know, career training that our generation that we're looking at, the kids that we spend all our time with, uh, maybe the most important mantra that they may face because they are going into uncharted territory. They are going into the unknown where the outcomes are not clearly defined. And they have to be comfortable with that unknown and then try to get after it and try to solve those problems. Like I said at the beginning, you know, I think this generation, you know, this generation that we're looking at now, they will determine the fate of not just the next 50 years, but the next 10,000 years. So, recently, a couple years ago, I, I joined forces with the former president of National Geographic, and we started really thinking about what we could do to bring Hollywood and the best of storytelling into the classroom and at the same time think through how we can take on those huge 8 million people online in a single weekend kind of opportunities. 
and have that exist in the classroom. I went up and talked to my high school teacher who had a huge influence on, on me, a woman by the name of Esther Wojcicki, who had, she just wrote this book called Moonshots in Education, and she, she started this whole journalism program up in the Bay Area. And the whole thing was around getting kids to have agency, right? I mean, her classrooms are chaotic. You wouldn't even think of it as a classroom. It's just a newsroom. It's going nuts. And she's really not even there. She's more like just hanging out every once in a while, you know. But the kids are going nuts. And they won't even leave the classroom. Six o'clock rolls around. She's kicking people out the door. And we started thinking, how can we take that and build that into something that's more accessible, you know, across multiple platforms. The kids that grew up in the digital age, what are they going to do? So funded by a company in Nevada that actually was really into science, we launched Planet 3. The idea is around bringing really intense visual experiences and storytelling into the NGSS standards. So we're looking at all those NGS standards and saying, well, you know, what can we do that might be better than what Pearson's or McGraw-Hill can do? What can we actually deliver that's going to be more experiential? Can we go and tap into all those producers in Hollywood and figure out a way to make it awesome and fun and experiential? But then, at the same time, can we bring in all that data that's coming from NASA, from NOAA, from NEON, from all these other agencies, and, and, and can we actually start adding to that with a cohort of kids that might be using a platform like this? Can we get them, you know, those kids, to start feeling empowered, to start producing content themselves, where they can be writing and voting on each other's content and telling the broader story of what they think is actually happening to the world. Since we put all this pressure on kids to own the future, have them start getting in the driver's seat right now. And the last video I want to show you is a video of what, we, what we're building. This is what Planet 3 feels like. have a chance. You know, maybe planet three, the third planet from the sun, becomes our moonshot. I end with that picture of my kid staring, you know, into his hands. I think there was actually a bee flying around him at that point. And I think of all these technologists trying to send ourselves to Mars or to the moon, these are the planets. And yet, the majority of our planet hasn't even been explored at all. And it's our only home. And it's the ultimate project. And so when I think about careers for the future, it's less about, you know, those degrees in college which will give you a job, and it's more about that thing inside you which will allow you to take on any challenge, whether it be personal 
or global and do something about it. Anyway, I thank you for your time and am honored to be here among the people that will determine the fate of the next 10,000 years because you are instilling that character into the kids that will be our greatest agents of change. So thank you very much. Thank you. I think there's some. Is what age level is was it developed for, um, and is it is it already available, or is it something that's still on? Yeah, works? we've spent the last year piloting uh, in the state of Nevada, in Clark County, and Washington County, with about you know a cohort of teachers uh, that is pretty large, and. The target right now is sixth, seventh, and eighth grade middle school. Uh, you know, there's this huge sort of drop off in in kids' interest in science in general in that kind of pipeline. So we figured that was a good opportunity for us. And you know, what we're seeing is that you know what we're really seeing is that there's a combination of platform and professional development in science for NGSS that is required. So you know, I hope I hope that we can help with both of those in some ways um, and be a part of that story. But it's right now at a point where we're looking to start piloting with other teachers in the state of California because we're, we're not trying to like, you know, I mean the majority of my team is actually, they're all curriculum writers and former educators and then a few game designers and media producers. And you know, what we're really trying to do is, it's, it's all about the education team first. They're really the center of our company. So uh, they're, they're trying to work hand in hand with the realistic nature of classrooms, which are all so different. So the platform's super modular because it's like every classroom is going to be different. Uh, and then work with teachers in a very diverse set of settings. So when you go to the state of Nevada, it's like you have great schools and then you have terrible setups as well, you know, really tough schools as well. So we're trying to see how this might fit into many different scenarios like that. But if there's, if there's teachers here in the state of California that want to give it a shot, we would love to, love to work with you guys. Anybody else? What other questions do we have? I think uh, not all of us have had the opportunities that you've had to have those oh shit moments. And um, when you were laying in the hospital bed, what promises did you make to yourself? Um, you know, I think the only promise I made to myself was... What's that? That you were going to make it here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, Randy was like, I actually missed another lecture that I had because uh, I was in the hospital. Randy's like, you asshole, Albert. You no, no. <laughs> I was like, you totally don't have to be here. It's no, okay. No. Um, uh, I think the only promise I made to myself was to stay positive because I think in life you have a real choice of how you experience the world in any given circumstance. You can take any situation and you can choose to be positive or you can choose to be negative and it's the entire difference between your life right uh, between one one way or the other so in my mind it was like okay I'm just gonna stay super pumped um, and I'm gonna choose to look at this as an opportunity rather than a you know a setback and it was just a choice like literally just a choice it was like I'm deciding uh, and then also having the support around me that was like okay they're gonna back me up and keep me stoked. Uh, so I think, you know, I think that's kind of the secret sauce of life, you know, just uh, you've got two ways to look at any situation or multiple ways, but if you decide inside that it's going to be a more positive viewpoint, then, then, you know, you can lose everything, but actually have gained a lot. Yep. Um, first of all, thank you. Um, Mind is blown. Still trying to think about all this. Um, my question is, you know, we think it, when we're working within our classrooms, it's something I've thought about a lot, and you're looking at global problems, and you're looking at these students being, you know, the, the, those who are going to be hopefully trying to solve these global problems. And we look at, I mean, really inspiring, like, you know, I interactive curriculum that you're developing and all this. but. And, and now we have technology that allows us to, to communicate, but I don't, I just was wondering your thoughts on tr 
what, what we can do as educators to start helping those students make those connections to each other across the world and other um, you know, parts and different cultures and stuff and trying to put these together. Um, just didn't know if you had any thoughts yeah. on that. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, like at a very practical level, I think it's, it's as, I've always found that writing into the black hole actually gets a lot of times a response. So, you know, it's as simple as reaching out to a school in another, in another country or maybe even writing to the State Department or something like that and asking them if they've got connections. I know that maybe not right now, but, you know, that the, uh, <laughs> yeah, we had a couple years. Uh, then, yeah, I'm just kidding. So, I totally got distracted there with that. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, the age of connectivity is definitely upon us, and as simple as Skyping within another classroom may unlock a child's view of a broader world. Uh, and I think that human experience with another, with another person on another side of a digital screen can actually be quite human. Uh, you know, there was this experiment that Coca-Cola, of all people, did where they put this, like, this interactive visual portal between these two malls, one in India and one in Pakistan, and they had people hanging out with each other and dancing and playing, and it was like this big breakdown of these cultural barriers, uh, these, these sort of, this government-based wall that had been built between these two countries was being broken down by the simple act of seeing another person on the screen and talking to them and, and experiencing the, the humanness of that other person. So I've always found that <clears throat> What I've tried to do, uh, you know, in classrooms is I go and meet with classrooms all over the world via Skype. You know, I mean, it's so simple. You just go and people reach out. I mean, whenever a teacher reaches out to me from anywhere, I'll, I'll do a little Skype interview with their classroom. There's a ton of opportunities there. But the broader context is, is if you make a child feel, I shouldn't even say child, a person, feel like they're an agent of some value in the global conversation, then I think that sticks, you know? So uh, it's even as if you could just give the kids in your classroom some kind of project that might, might have meaning, like, like uh, you know, like posting a blog or something like this about, uh, you know, their setup and, and what their lives are like and having a sister blog in another part of the world or something like this, you know, where they feel like they're having a conversation at a global scale, I think that makes, this important moment begin where kids realize that they're actually, you know, their voice is actually recognized as important. Uh, and what I've always done with my kids is just taking them super seriously. You know, like everything they say, I just take it super seriously. Uh, and I feel like, you know, it, sometimes they talk back to me now a lot more. But at the same time, uh, I feel so proud that when I hear them talking to other people in the world, they they speak with a, a, a position of, of self-confidence, you know, and I think self-confidence is gonna be required uh, in any career, specifically in the age in which most jobs today won't allow you to break out of, a, uh, out of the sort of income disparity that's growing over time, unless it's a creative job or an intellectual property job or something like this where you're building something. Uh, you know, you're, you're seeing more and more degrees have less and less value uh, you know, and I think overall what you're, what you're realizing is that entrepreneurship, which could be applied to anything, saving the planet or whatever, uh, it's really just driven by a sense of confidence, you know? I mean, like believing in your curiosity, believing in your idea, that's it. So just like driving that confidence into a kid uh, in any discipline <laughs> will pretty much change their, their lives forever. Yeah. <coughs> All right, anything else? Well, with that, I'm gonna drop the mic. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Albert, right. thank you so much. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you, guys. <laughs>